Hi, energy. Hi, energy. Hi, everybody. And welcome, <laughs> welcome back to Human Factors Cast. This is episode 245. We're recording this live on May 12th, 2022. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I am joined today by Mr. Barry Kirby. Very high energy, Barry Kirby. Good evening. Very high energy. Perfect. Hey, we got a great show for you all tonight. We're going to be talking about human robot interaction and really technology in general and how it's going to change the food industry. And later, we're going to answer some questions from the community about combating disinformation through human factors, HCI, UX, all that stuff. We're also going to be talking about preparing for graduate school if you're gaining research experience is not an option and the struggle we all have with scope creep. But first, here's some programming notes. Last week, I messed up the schedule royally, so I made sure that this week it is correct. So upcoming, we have, on the 19th, we have a normal episode for you all. On the 26th, we're going to provide some coverage of EHF. Barry has some wonderful folks who have... Uh, interviewed in is that the, called in to uh 1202 we're going to be sharing some across and we're going to be sitting down talking about that uh and on the 2nd of june we're going to be off and then we'll be back for a normal show back on the 9th of june but barry what's going on with 1202 still summer hiatus what's what's up I've, I've got no idea. Just, just nothing's happening. No, in, in reality, I've been, uh, with work and everything, I've been uh, snowed under, So, and I've been lining up some awesome interviews. So we've got some awesome, awesome interviews coming up, um, and that will be we'll be back into a proper schedule again in the next couple of weeks. Awesome. And I'm looking forward to your EHF coverage that's coming soon, too. Yes, hopefully. Right. If we, I've, I've got all them interviews. All, they're all done, done now, with the exception of one, which is Amanda. And so we're going to have a specific show on that as well. And we got, If we can get this all done right, and there's no reason why we shouldn't, because we're very competent people, we'll release it all in the same week. So we'll have my stuff go out on the Monday, we'll have this go out on the Thursday, and it'll all be like seamlessly planned amazingness. Seamless podcast synergy. All right, we know why you're all here. You're here for the news, so let's go ahead and get right into it. Yes, this is the part of the show where we talk all about Human Factors news. Barry Kirby, where's the beef? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, is that how we're starting? Okay, so the story this week is from ButcherBots to Robo Burger Flippers. Six ways the food industry is turning uh, to tech in 2022. So restaurants and food suppliers around the world are taking lessons really learned from the pandemic and in many cases adapting them technologies to more permanent solutions. An article by Gizmodo details some of the examples that were used in the pandemic that may have a long-lasting impact. And so I'm just going to quickly go through these six uh, different um uh, six different technologies. So within food preference cookery itself, Mizo Electronics, uh, sorry, Mizo Robotics made a splash during the pandemic with its burger flipping bot, aptly dubbed Flippy, which serves around 300 burgers a day. But also My uh, Mizo have come up with another bot called Chippy, which funny enough, focuses on the preparing of tortilla chips. We also go into robot butchery, where meat processors are investing in autonomous butcher robots capable of deboning and butchering meat. Uh, the industry reportedly hopes that these autonomous systems could one day reduce workplace injuries associated with the butchery business. The pandemic acted as a real accelerant for these butcher bots uh, because the journal, the journal that we got this from noted that since the crowded factory floors were a hotbed for COVID-19 transmission. Then we also talk about automatic doorman. And this is looking at uh, the use of facial recognition because that has proved whilst it's proven contentious, grocery stores and bars and, and them sort of places, in particularly in the UK, but also in the US, are trying to use the tech to guess their patrons' ages. Online ordering, as we know, was already around before the pandemic, but actually during the pandemic, it surged in online ordering, promoting an uplift in restaurants, developing and enhancing their own apps. As an example, a number of fast food chains are also now using location tracking data to keep tabs on the diners or the couriers in order to have their food ready ready for pickup just at the right moment. Self-checkout. Um, cashierless self-checkout systems have existed for a number of years in many grocery stores, but also fast food chains like McDonald's for, um, have, have used them now for quite a lot for ordering. But they could see even wider adoption this year, thanks in part to the pandemic habits and, and tight labour markets. And finally, something that has really um, exploded um, over here in the West is QR codes. They've been used as replacements for physical menus or... Um, or for, for direct line for diners to order their meals. 
Last year, it saw a 750% increase in downloads over the span of 18 months. It's believed companies using QR codes could potentially save between 30 and 50% on labor costs alone by reducing their number of servers. So, Nick, that's a very quick overview. What's your thought on the rise of the uh, the robot chefs? Yeah, so a couple thoughts here. One, robot o- overlords, blah, 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 blah. Uh, second thought was uh, looking for thumbnails this week was uh, made me very hungry, obviously looking for a lot of food. Uh, and the third question, or I guess the third real first real point I had third point here is where's the human factors. And I, I made the joke at the top. Where's the B it's a visual gag because on the little ticker we have, where's the B H F anyway, feel like I had to explain that joke. So it's not really a joke anymore. Cause I had to explain it, but here's the thing is when you look at the story at face value, you're like, okay, cool technology in food industry. I mean, what human factors where, but we got a great breakdown for you of exactly where this touches human factors. We're going to try something a little bit different in terms of the format tonight. Um, but from a societal perspective, anytime there's new technologies, I feel like there's going to be a large pushback from some folks. And we can talk a little bit about that in society and culture. But Barry, I, before we move on, I want to get your initial thoughts on this article. Yeah, I mean, obviously, around technology and any sort of geekery then I, then I'm down with this that this sort of thing is really cool and I love seeing it in action but when you look at that wider thing um so I'm going to start pushing back right from the beginning um to a certain extent because we sort of got to think about this in terms of you know are we, are we going to start losing artisan skills because of the um, you know within the restaurant business within uh, within that within that type of thing are we just going to fundamentally um forget how to cook, how to do some of this basic stuff in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, if we talk about going out and having that restaurant experience, well, where's the humanity? Is it all just about getting that burger as quickly as you can in a fast food chain? Or do you want that broader experience of of having somebody creating your food, being presented with the food and you know that, that type of thing? Um, but then we do get into that whole bigger cultural bit about jobs of the future. Every time we, that is that constant pushback of whenever we get a level of automation, that's taken away somebody's job, apparently. Now, the there is that wider discussion around. Well, actually, do, are, they, are jobs just becoming different? Um, but fundamentally, it, it, that is something that we are going to have to think about. It does lead you into conversations around things like universal ba- basic income. What is the future of the workplace and things like that? But that might be going a bit far for tonight. Um, so, do we want to go into our newly polished and new way of analysing um, these stories and and and? bust out the human factors domains. Yeah, let's let's talk about human factors domains because what we've done traditionally is, well, I guess we used to kind of have this approach, but then somewhere in the episode 200s, we kind of got to this approach of like, let's focus down a really specific rabbit hole, give some really interesting backstory about a specific aspect of a story and then talk about it through the lens of the story. But I think really tonight, there's just so much interesting stuff here that we wanted to try it a different way. So we're going to take a look at these through various human factors domains and really kind of focus on that and really how it all impacts this story here in technology and food industry. And so the first thing we can kind of start with here is the obvious human AI robot teaming. There's going to be a lot going on here between the human actor and the robot actor in this space, especially when we talk about the technologies that focus on robots here, right? There's other technologies. You mentioned QR codes. You mentioned self-checkout. I'm talking about HRI right now. There's things that we have to consider, like where does the handoff occur from you know, a, 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 a human operator to a robot operator? If you think about like the butchering example, the robot butcher, uh, well, how, you know, when, when it's done, does the robot hand it over to you? Does it put it down? And then you pick it up as an, as a human, uh, wh- where's that transfer? Um, and how do you make sure that it's done safely? We'll talk about safety separately, but thinking about that handoff, where does it occur? Uh, burger flippers, same thing. Do they set the burgers aside for you to sort of, uh, put them on a bun? You know, do you have an assembly maker then at that point, uh, a sandwich artist, And then, you know, it's kind of like all that stuff. And then, of course, there's the seminal trust in the robot's ability to do their job. Does the human trust a robot butcher with a knife uh, that they will not cleave them and and hurt them? 
We can talk about safety later too. So there's a lot of things going on here just from a high level human AI robot teaming perspective. Barry, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it, that's this is going to be one of the key bits because normally when you go to um like to a restaurant, it, it goes back to kind of what we we're saying around do you are you just wanting fast food thrown out at you? So you're going through your um your, through your burger joint and actually it's just an assembly of um of ingredients, it's wrapped and then presented to you. That probably would be fine. I don't know. As a as a gut feel, that would be fine. That would be kind of what we would expect. Um, but then if you're going to like say quite a posh restaurant. Um, you could sort of see the, you know, some of the cooking being done in the back by some some, some level of automation. You've got chefs there. You've got automated. Um, so you've got robot chefs doing their thing. How would they all work together as a team? Because you know, chef, um, restaurant kitchens get very busy, very hectic. How would all that work? But then is there another another element there? Because there's there's this rise in the restaurants that, um, you know, you have a chef out the front, don't you? Where they're doing fancy knife work. They're doing. Um, showing how they can f cut meat up in different ways and cut the vegetables very fast. And all that. Is there going to be an element there that where you have the robot in the almost the center of the room um, and it being used almost as, as a display performance piece, cooking all that food um, and and then, you know, delivering out to people? How how do we make all that work? And um, is that the sort of thing we, we want to be seeing? So... I think how we how we engage with them is going to be a, a key element in all of this. Yeah, I agree. Take it take it to personnel. Right. So picking up the personnel piece is really about how is this going to involve involve people and, and affect people. So on the positive side, we've already talked about um I think these are gonna have um things like sharp things, we're talking about hot things, we're gonna have the opportunities for, for being cut for uh, for burns, you know, what you do normally in, in, in a kitchen or a or a foodstuffs environment. Um it was already said that you know the the but the, the the meat processing um uh, places were were rife for um for infection um or um, transmitting infection. So having something like uh like this approach actually reduces um risk for people. It keeps people safer in a hazardous environment if everything goes to plan. It also reduces the number of people, if you look at a, a staffing side of things, reduces the number of people that a business needs to run. If you want a, a niche business or something like, say, like a burger joint, that type of thing, if you can get a lot more automated things, then you've got more of a chance of running a business and keeping your overhead low because you're running uh, you're, you're running with all this machinery. Um, as, we've all, as I've kind of said a number of times now, you know, in terms of, that fast food bit, then that will probably fulfill the requirement of the people who are getting that sort of food. It will get that food quickly. It will be to the right sort of standard when we'll talk about sort of the engineering design of it later on. Um, and But then we look at sort of like, as, as mentioned, does that fit what we have in terms of standard restaurant? Um, does that does that fulfill an experience? Which then leads you into then that idea of um, what is the what what is that cultural thing around going out for a meal? What is it we expect from that? What what is the social script around that? Um, is there anything you want to bring in yeah. on, on the personnel side? Yeah, a little bit about social scripts, right? We have this kind of expectation as a society that we walk into a restaurant. I'm talking sit down here, and we sit down. We look at the menu that is handed to us, which we'll talk a little bit about in a minute here. Uh, but like you know, from the QR code side, you it took me a minute to kind of. Uh, get used to the QR codes. I've expected to be handed a menu. My script, my social script of understanding what happens when you sit in a restaurant is already sort of getting uh, the perception of that is changing. And so what happens then when you have, yes, more and more technology, more and more automation, do you sort of stand in line at maybe a fast food restaurant, realize there's no cashier and you have to go to a self-service kiosk? How long do you wait there before that is understood. How long do you sit at a table before you realize that, uh, that these menus are not being handed to you? There's changes that we will have to make as a culture, as a society. We can talk about society and culture later about how we perceive these things. And so it's not just the people in the restaurant that are working there, but also the folks that are coming there as patrons. So let's talk a little bit about the way these places are set up, environmental design, right? I, I mentioned how long will you have to wait before you realize you have to go to self-checkout. You have to do a self-checkout for your food. 
uh, well, there's there's designing the spaces. You have to do some consideration around designing spaces for that self checkout experience, right? Do you make it front and center? You do put it up against the register where the person traditionally was, so you still have an expectation of going up to the counter, pressing your buttons, getting your food. But it, so it's in the same place, just different way to interact with it. That's something we have to think about, right? If we put these robots like burger flippers, chip makers, meat choppers in the kitchen, we have to think about how that space is also designed as well. You know, in fast food places, those kitchens can be quite tiny. And so you have to really think hard about the way the robot is interacting with the things that it's doing. You know, does the burger flipper sit above the the grill or does it sit in front of it, obscuring kind of a walkway for others to kind of walk through? So that's something that you have to consider. You also think about in the future, right? This wasn't mentioned in the article, but I can imagine a world where we have delivery robots. So now instead of waiters and waitresses, we have delivery robots putting your food on your table for you. You have to design a space that is not only conducive to having a robot move through that environment, but also make it so that way they can quickly duck out of the way in case a, a human is coming. And also you have to consider whether or not that robot is you know, handling food uh, or any other delicate, let's say delicate uh, objects on board, right? So just thinking about all this stuff, there's also the issue of making these robots visible in the environment. It's going to be an entirely different way to interact with these things that are not there now, right? We're changing mm -hmm. those social scripts. We have to think about making those robots vis visible, but also that could be aesthetically unpleasing, right? You have a bright yellow uh, safety vest, yellow safety vest, orange robot in this restaurant, does it mess with the sort of environment and what does that do for your experience? There's a lot to consider when it comes to environmental design. Barry, passing it back over to you, any thoughts? Yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff here that is done already and we can take what, what's going to be really cool about this is just taking that innovation to move in. So, you know, self-checkout, you know, we, we, there's famous burger joints that do that already um that i now use on a fairly regular basis it took what a couple of sessions to going into that restaurant before you're like actually you know that's the way it's done would you want the same would you be happy with that same sort of experience in in something a bit more high-end again that goes back to that social script right um but at this design of the kitchens i think is really interesting because it's i if we're going to get it right going back to the human AI, um, ai robot teaming piece we can't just design the robot to fit in around the human or the human to fit in around the robot. It's We've got to get into this co-design piece and, and make sure that we're making the best of both worlds um, and basically using the right, the right, almost the right tool for the right job um, and, and making that that way, which is at the moment we do sort of have a bit of an attitude of, well, the robot's there, therefore the human has to move around it and, and be aware of it. There's, with the development of what we're doing now, there's a there's a lot more potential around good co um, co design. Um, so I'm going to then go into the performance and training side of things. So really, what we should be having here these um, these the robots and things should give you a high level of performance, and but we that has to come with a low training burden because we're not going to have experts around all the time to be able to manage and you know, with these robots, if they're well designed, they're, if they're well engineered, they shouldn't have a, a high maintenance or a, a high breakdown threshold. Um, so we should be able to go into the, um, the the training element should be low. We have phones now that are very, very complicated. Nobody ever reads an instruction book for them anymore. And we're going to have to get there with that. However, when it does go wrong, it's a bit like we have spoken about this in terms of, a, a, you know, um, using autonomous vehicles. What happens when that goes down? You need to then step up to an alternative. So what is going to, what's going to be that backup? And therefore, how are you going to train your staff to deal with that type of thing? Um, and then we, so with that, that training element, we do need to train the operators to interact with the new technologies. And it's not just the, uh, it's not just the employees, but how are the public expected to go into a place and know what, how much time are we going to give them? How much, um, how much, because you know, there's going to have to be an element of promotion and and thing around. Look, we've got a new way of interacting. How long does that go on for? I think there's um, there is enough precedent precedent out there. But I do remember going to a um, a restaurant a number of years ago, and they tried to pioneer something along the remote side. But all it was was a speaker and microphone in the center of the table. Now, as soon as we uh, we went in, I'm having to put a newspaper over the center of the table. I had no idea 
um, that I was meant to interact with this thing in that way because it was hidden to me straight away because I I hidden it by accident. Uh, we need to make sure that um, that it's it's well highlighted until it gets properly embedded as a uh, um, as a true activity. So, is there anything you want to bring in here on performance and training? No, I think I think you kind of hit it there. You know the the way in which we introduce this technology into the food industry is going to be critical, right? One time I went into a restaurant and there's this little tablet looking thing on the edge of the table that you can then pay for your meal at. And, you know, the first time I was like, oh, man, that was uh, that was this is a new thing. What what does it do? Right. So there's like this element of discovery. Um, and when you think about training personnel in the environment itself or, or, or sorry, the employees, that makes sense. But then you have to make things sort of usable. We'll talk about usability a little bit later talk about um, sort of making things intuitive and usable for the people who you can't give training to necessarily. So let's uh, jump in a little bit to sort of these communications privacy concerns. I mentioned, how do you communicate these changes? That is something, uh, especially when it's from the orderer's perspective, you can't train them, right? It's a question. Um, and, and, you know, I mentioned the story earlier. Barry, did you get used to QR codes uh, or menus quickly when they started introducing them? Because I, I didn't. I sat at a table for a while. I was expecting, you know, the wait, waiter waitress to give me uh, a physical copy. No, I, I was, it was, a, uh, and it still is now the whole using QR codes is I just find it is a bit, non-intuitive to a certain extent un unless it's well advertised un unless it's out there i still see it as a as an addition it, it doesn't still feel like a like a main process yet right yeah i feel i feel like that is going to be something that's interesting to look at we also have to look at sort of these privacy concerns when you look at data collected on people um is that being communicated right are your button presses on those little kiosks on the side being communicated to uh, the patrons that that data is being collected. I think there's kind of a mutual understanding, but then there's some of the other technologies going on that it's maybe less obvious where you have that facial recognition. Are there any, is there anything in the environment that lets you know that you are being uh, monitored via, you know, like there's the, the little uh, signs that say this area is monitored by CCTV. Um, is there anything that communicates that your face is being analyzed by AI against a database? All that stuff. It's things that we need to think about. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's, any any thoughts on communication privacy concerns? Not really. I think you got it, got most of it nailed. I think it is going to be really key, certainly in the um, early adopter phase. If you look at the, uh, the, the innovation curve, that early bit of, uh, of getting people on board, it, it, the communication is going to be absolutely key. If we go into system safety and uh, and health hazards, the I mean a lot of this is is kind of fairly obvious, you know. From you know, kitchen should be kept clean. They should be kept sanitary. Um, the, um, the 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 food should be cooked to the right temperature for what it is, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this would still absolutely apply. Um, the you know it just needs to apply to um, the the automation as much as it does the the people. It is also about keeping operators safe. You mentioned earlier about you know how does the how does the automated the robot or whatever it is work in the kitchen and how do we make sure people keep safe? Um, then there's the good design stuff around isolation, the emergency stops, but robot wielding knives. You know any good movie that anybody's watched, that's something to be um, to be aware of, shall we say? Um, but robots move. You know, if we if we're doing it right, then robots move. We we'll, we would expect them to either move or traverse around the kitchen doing deliveries, as you mentioned earlier. That's all stuff that we need to um, need to think about. And I don't I don't want to make it sound like I'm just saying you know safety needs to be done. Um, it's obvious. It kind of is, but I don't think it's actually vastly different to the sort of things we should be thinking about already. We've just got a different factor in there. Do you think I'm being a bit blasé about that, or do you think there's more to consider? No, I think you're right. I think, you know, the more we kind of keep these environments in check, right, we kind of talked a little bit about it in environmental design, but really those those environmental factors as well as safety play in hand-in-hand in hand together. And I think the more we can think about where the human is at in any sort of one given moment, right? Whether they're walking to the restroom and potentially running into a robot in the hallway there, whether you are in the kitchen with a 
knife wheeling robot there? Is it, you know, are, are you, is that behind a cage that they then, you know, throw it over to you between a thing? It, it all kind of, um, that those are considerations that we need to make from that perspective. And so I think you're absolutely right. Hit the nail on the head. Let's talk a little bit about usability, system evaluation, accessibility, because I think these are pretty big topics here, especially um, when you consider just in general, the usability of these online ordering apps, right? You're thinking about people at home. Um, there's some interesting things going on with it, with those. Uh, that's, again, not a technology that we talked about in the main story, but something that we need to consider because um, those things are almost nefariously designed in order to get you to buy more, like having uh, exclusive discounts on some of these things. And so the whole usability aspect of those online ordering um, decision-making systems, right? You know, how do you, how do you help me make a decision about what I want? Everything looks the same. Um, <laughs> the usability of self-checkout, we need to look at that stuff, right? So how, again, how easily is it placed in the environment for others to understand where it's at? Um, or really how, how long before it times out after a user stops pressing it? So how long does the next person have to wait if the person just ahead of them gets frustrated and leaves? How do you communicate what's in your cart? All this stuff. So there's a lot of different things that we have to think about from that side of it. Now, I want to bring up a point from the chat here, a uh, question about AI potentially helping with accessibility, both for patrons and employees. This is by Buddha of Light. Uh, and so uh, on our Twitch, I want to bring this up because this is a really important point from accessibility perspective. Um, when you think about sort of making these things accessible, you need to consider everyone in your design, really. You need to think about the people who may not be able to pull out a phone um, or, or be able to understand some of the social cues around needing to interact with a QR code or... Um, you know, even from uh, uh, the perspective of an employee uh, uh, that is potentially um, unable to work with robots in a in a in a manner that is cooperative, those are things that we need to consider as well. Barry, I want to pass it over to you. Any thoughts here? It's interesting, isn't it? Because the I guess that there's one element around the use of AI to help with that with accessibility of itself. So. Are we going to be able to use AI to help patrons access the service or the products that we are going to deliver? So does that mean we can actually step back and be less prescriptive around how we order? So you could actually just be turning around and saying, I want some food. And and it understands uh, maybe more about you and can do, help you derive what it is that you actually want if you can't communicate in a, in a more obvious way. Also, it, when you're looking at it from a um, an employee perspective, would it shape because we are, we're already seeing it um if you can't engage or use the technology does that mean you're just not employable um is this going to have that sort of social social impact um or is it going to help us with people who are um you know maybe allow us to employ people who are more neurodiverse or with physical disabilities or or whatever within the kitchens and actually use what they use their their skills to their most potential because they're supported by AI and by technology. Um, it's it's an interesting one about, it could go either way, I think, um, depending on, on going back to the, you know, the social constructs and what the drivers are within within that society. Um, right. Yeah, well, I, th I think we could spend like almost like another episode just, just talking <laughs> about this specific issue. We could, you know, one last, what, or not last point, but one more point that, you know, you could think about too is designing for those who are wheelchair bound. Um, and so thinking about the height of uh, some of these self-checkout systems, do you design something that's universal for, uh, you know, teenagers and um, folks in wheelchairs to be able to access these? Or do you have an ADA compliant wheelchair uh, or sorry, not wheelchair, ADA compliant self-checkout system that is at a different height for those uh, who are unable to reach it? at the, the other quote unquote standard height, right? So there's other things that we can think about here and you're absolutely right. We could break this down in a whole separate uh, breakdown, but I, I wanna hear a little bit more about engineering, Barry. You wanna jump oh, into I'll, that? 
I'll take engineering. Absolutely. The um, I mean, the engineering. This is going to be really interesting. I think a lot of it we probably already understand from um, doing that translation from different areas that use things like robotics and that already. But it's around making sure the engineering standard is up there and the systems engineer is there to make sure that they work. You know, that ninety nine percent of the time because the maintenance here is um, is going to cost money. Um, the the hospitality industry is it works on largely I think believe fairly thin margins given but and a lot of repetition so anything that you're doing with this it needs to be be a high level of of um, uptime but any maintenance that do, that needs to be done regular maintenance then that needs to be um, easy to do again we've talked about how to train people and all that sort of stuff then um, that needs to be uh, really good because if you if the maintenance is difficult it'll get skipped and that means then you're into more downtimes but then you do need to step into what happens when they do fail um, how do they fail safe how do they fail um, in a way that a user um, or a human operator can then go and step in um, um, and in, in, in either con complete what was going on or gracefully degrade the service of the overall uh, overall establishment. And we've talked about similar things to this again with the auto autonomous vehicles and how they come out of auto drive. And there were some really good papers done on the in the recent ergonomics uh, conference around around this very topic. And then the other bit is it's obviously going to be highly sanitized. Now I guess we can draw some um, parallels here to like the health industry as well as uh, other bits and bobs, but you have some very high end engineering things, but they need to be able to work in a way that is very clean um, because of the because of you know the, the obvious. So that's a really high level sketch through engineering, but I think there's a, there's a whole lot of stuff there that needs to play. Have you got any thoughts on that, or do you want to crack on? Yeah, let's just go ahead and get in. We're running short on time. I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about the social, organizational, societal real impacts here. Because for me, there's the question of how will society perceive these uh, incremental improvements, right? If they happen over time slowly, I don't think there's there's going to be some pushback, but it won't be as big as if we make all these sweeping changes at once. Now, the article in Gizmodo is suggesting that these will all take place in 2022. I don't know if all of them will see the light of day in 2022, but these technologies exist. And when we use them in tandem, we have to think about what the interaction effects between them are for really understanding how people will see this. Well, you mentioned, you know, at the top, is this the sort of beginning of the end for discussions about UBI or uh, jobs in general? How do they change over time? I think this is a really important question to ask. And my sort of takeaway question for the motivations for implementing these technology, or really any technology, is what's the motivation behind it? Is it to reduce cost for the patrons, for the people who are buying the hamburgers, or is it to ultimately increase the profit for the C-suite? And I uh, cynical me says, you know, increased profit for C-suite, but you did bring up the good example of having these technologies available it reduces the number of overhead and therefore could make it more accessible to those who wanted to start their own business because they don't need to hire as many people. They can just buy these robots and call it done. And so does it then further serve democratization of the food industry? Can more people get into this field because the technology makes it available? Uh, I don't know. These are just high level questions. Barry, I want to hear about your thoughts and opinions on the societal organizational changes here. I think this is going to be a bit of a game changer, if I'm honest, the, the in the way that we think about technology and technology adoption, because in some of the other bits, if you're working in the factory realms, if you work in an auto, in, um, you know, manufacturer and things like that, you've seen robots around now for quite a while. Um, if you work in warehousing and, and logistics, you've seen robots and, and automation now for, for quite a while. But it's always kind of a damn's that it's at work or it's on the road, it's in the air, but it actually doesn't affect you sort of on a day-to-day -day basis that's really in your face. This will put it in your face. Um, actually, quite literally, if they get the programming wrong. Um, but it will be, it'll, you know, you'll take that, um, the food will could be delivered to you completely autom automated um, and and you know what what will that do to us as as a, as a society the um the this sector is, is i believe the the biggest employer um throughout the world you know in the, in, the, in the hospitality sector this will um not only um it could make it safer it could make it more efficient but it could also put more people on the um on the dole queue and you know in in the in the, in, in the job center so 
what is it going to do? And I think it it will be really interesting to see how it evolves. I think it could be really good. I think, you know, I think it could reduce costs for patrons. I think it could increase profit. Neither of them are a bad thing as long as we do it in the right way. Um, and we we, uh, we we make it go forward. So, yeah, I think it's going to be quite um, quite interesting and I'm, I'm quite looking forward to it. Have you got any sort of, you mentioned the time, have you got any sort of final thoughts on the um, on the overall article or anything else we should be considering yeah i mean you know the the society and organizational all those points really could be tied up into its own discussion its own episode its own separate podcast series whatever I, there's just so much to think about with introducing new technology and i you know there's an interesting comment on the article uh on the website itself it was a comment on remote cashiers and sort of a it's almost like a medium or a midpoint between introducing like self checkout technology outright and slowly transitioning into that uh, adoption of technology where maybe you have remote cashiers um, where, you know, cashiers sitting at home at their computer and they're still cashiering, but they are presented on a video screen inside the restaurant, right? That might be one way to sort of drive adoption a, a of these technologies from that societal view, when you think about how many places this could touch, that would be a lot le- a lot more palatable for you know the the those screaming it, they took our jobs, and then it would also be more palatable for those patrons coming into the restaurant saying, "I don't know what to do here. Can somebody help me?" Um, and so it's an interesting point. I wanted to bring that up because the speed at which we adopt technology is also a critical factor for adoption of that technology. Barry, what about you? Any, any sort of last loose rounds on this? Yeah, I guess just one final thought for me around, you know, let's talk about the human factors of stuff in, in this. And um, there's been a recent review of human factors in around food safety in Ireland. And, and actually their research showed that there's 86 closures uh, closure orders in Ireland, so that's 86 establishments that are, are dealt are told to close every year due to human factors related issues, largely down to risk management of cooking and of storage. So clearly, automation, robotics, and that can play a lot, a, a large part in stopping a number of them them closures um, because of like the use of technologies to do the appropriate sensing, the appropriate measures, and the appro- you know putting in um, that that level of situation awareness that um, the the uh, appropriate decisions can be made in a timely manner. So just uh, just as a, a food for thought, there is definitely loads of scope there for, for human factors in all of this. Food for thought. Was that a pun I heard? All right. Well, no, thank you. <laughs> thank you to our patrons this week and not our Twitter followers because actually they disagreed when our patrons actually outweighed them. For selecting our topic this week, thank you to our friends over to, at Gizmodo for our news story this week. If you want to follow along, we do post the links to all the original articles on our weekly roundups on our blog as we find them. Uh, you can also join us in our Discord for more discussion on these stories and much, much more. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back to see what's going on in the Human Factors community right after this. Human Factors Cast brings you the best in Human Factors news, interviews, conference coverage, and overall fun conversations into each and every episode we produce. But we can't do it without you. The Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running the show come from our listeners. Our patrons are our priority, and we want to ensure we're giving back to you for supporting us. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like access to our weekly Q&As with the hosts, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Minute, a Patreon-only weekly podcast where the hosts break down unique, obscure, and interesting Human Factors topics in just one minute. Patreon rewards are always evolving, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you, and remember, it depends. Yes, huge thank you as always to our patrons. We especially want to thank our honorary Human Factors cast staff, Michelle Tripp. Uh, thank you so much for all your support. Uh, hey, we have a website. Uh, our our uh, accountant says to plug the website. I don't. We don't get any money from the website. 
Uh, I don't know why they're asking us to plug it. Anyway, there's all sorts of fun stuff over there on our website. I don't know if you know this, but we have detailed show notes, including links to any of the guests that were on this week. Uh, there's embedded YouTube videos on those uh episodes so you can see once again how handsome mr barry kirby is if you're regularly an audio listener maybe check that out every once in a while there's also our news roundups i mentioned that that's where we sort of uh get all of our news and put it all into one place for you we have those weekly and a monthly roundup uh, we also post those kind of all over the internet so follow us on social for that as well um if we ever do have guests on the show we always have more information on those there's ways that you can submit your own news story uh so if you're a researcher that you want to be featured on the show let us know uh there's a link in the description of this episode or on our website you can do it there um you can also search on our website and i think that's one of the most powerful things our website offers is search so you can actually look through all of our episodes all of our news recaps all of our deep dives all of our human factors minute content see if there's a topic uh, on the thing that you're searching for. And of course, there's always our conference coverage. We're always trying to put out more content in different types of ways. In fact, that is the goal of our digital media lab. So if it's been a minute since you've checked out our website, please go take a look at humanfactorscast.media or we stole the domain, humanfactorspodcast.com. Barry is still salty about it. (laughs) No, I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and get into this next part of the show? It came from. Yes, this is the part of the show we like to call It Came From. This is where we search all over the internet to bring you topics the community is talking about. And no matter where you're watching, if you find these answers useful, give us a like to help other people find this content. That uh, virality kind of helps. Anyway, we have three up tonight. This first one here is from uh, this is from the last milk bender on the user experience subreddit. They say, how much do you think UX or HCI can help in combating disinformation spread and extremely polarized communities in digital platforms? I'm going to write, I'm just frustrated with the political turmoil in my country built on Facebook and TikTok's disinformation spread. Barry, we are now on TikTok helping with that disinformation spread. What do you think? How can Human Factors help? I think everybody should go to the Human Factors cast account on TikTok and um, and just go and do, experiment with it and just, just see what you think. Um, I think so th- there's two elements to this. So the biggest way of spreading disinformation largely is um is through bots and so that's where people have, have created fake effectively fake or automated accounts to um push forward a, um a, an agenda or, or or certain words or to to give them give themselves more influence so if we could allow people to see which you know from an hci perspective which accounts are bots and which accounts are real verified people um then then that would be a really really good thing or just get rid of the bots completely that would also be helpful um but some people use good bots in uh, so use bots in a good way it's only the you know it's 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 a bit of a, a sticky one but if you knew which accounts were um bots and which were which were real that would help the other side to this is we talk about you know that we we've have extremely polarized communities and things like that that's people that's the idea that actually people do have a broad variety of views. And you could argue that actually historically um, we've just never heard them before because our only way of, of listening to them has been through what we've read in the, in the press, in the printed or in the, uh, in the visual media. Well, now that we have all of these networks, all of these channels, all of these abilities, you know, even like for the likes of us to uh, promote and, and spread the good word about human factors, um, we have that ability. With no, you know, we, we don't go through any um, quality checking or anything like that. We, we just come on and ramble about what we like to talk about. Um, everybody's now got that opportunity to, to become um, a, a content creator. So... We might not like it, but actually, I think it's one of these things that's been there for a long time. And it's actually what we need to understand in terms of we have to become better at influencing people about getting across our point and and having grown up discussions around what we think and why we think them and become better at persuading um, and not just demanding that people think in the same way as we do. I think it's it's scary for many people because we not many people realize that I think that maybe their neighbors had 
the views that they had. And and this is almost an I, I don't want to be as it's almost like an age of enlightenment of people can have have their views. Um the downside of this is people can have their views without ramification as well. Um, so we lose a lot of that social structure, but I think that will probably be um, an entire, entirely different episode. What do you think, Nick? Do you think um, there's easy ways of doing this? Uh, yes. So let's actually break down what's happening here with disinformation spread um, and these polarized communities. What's happening is that these social media platforms are built on outrage. They They are built on engagement and the things that drive engagement are things that are outrageous. Us here at Human Factors Cast, we don't really do anything outrageous. And therefore, our stuff isn't surfaced in other ways, like, I don't know, things from Fox News that are very <laughs> highly uh, outrageous in a lot of ways sometimes. And so when you have these situations where you content creators put out content and um, then it is engaged on at a rate that's higher than everything else, those algorithms behind the scenes say, oh, this is therefore more worthy content. More people engage with it. It gets promoted. It's a cycle, right? Then you have sort of, uh, so so from a human factors perspective, behind the scenes, what we can do is give, d democratize the algorithm itself in what we value as a society, as a, as a culture, as a digital culture to um, highlight importance on. Right. If we if enough people flag it as inappropriate or enough people give us a thumbs down button, if things that, you know, are unacceptable to society, then maybe it'll be surfaced less. It is engagement, but maybe weigh that engagement against how much people dislike the thing um, and, and hide it for the greater good. There's also the consideration of sort of. The controls on the user perspective. Right. I already mentioned giving controls about uh, thumbs down, that type of thing. But then there's also sort of really how we uh, with respect to the communities. Right. So how we engage with those communities. We are surfaced a piece of content that looks at maybe an obscure topic, but they choose the things that are sort of semi believable. It's kind of like a gateway drug, if you will to these uh, communities that are often damaging um, to society. And so it's it's usually not the people that you think that go into these society. I think I'm like QAnon here, right? Uh, and I, I think I might get flagged with that term, but it's important to talk about. So if you think about Q supporters, right? They are often fed something that has a, a some sort of level of credibility uh, or or sort of what if, right? And and then they engage with it and then it puts them further into a certain category. And then these algorithms are feeding the people this content without them even realizing that they have now created a bubble for themselves. And so what you'll see, I don't think people are that polarized in reality. I think what happens is that these di digital media platforms are pushing society into these bubbles, which drive the most engagement. And so really it all comes down to can we rate these sources as a society and say, yes, this is credible. This is not credible. The research done here is sound research. The research said by these guys is, is just stuff that they babbled on a podcast. Are we an authoritative source for this? You know, and I, I, I understand that us in that algorithm would be deprioritized to other things like scientific journals. The importance is that with things like science and and communication, we have to be able to marry those two concepts because the better we can communicate scientific fact as real information instead of disinformation, the better we can be about sort of communicating on these online platforms. Anyway, soapbox down. Uh, I want to open it one more time, Barry. Any other closing thoughts on that one? Yes, we need we need to do a podcast on this because yes. I think it's really interesting because the, there is an element here of of one around. I completely agree with you on the scientific fact bit, but all, but on the other bit around what it is that people the algorithms only work because we know or the algorithms know that that's what people want to see. So you know that people will. I mean, this is where the TikTok algorithm I think is really clever. Where you get um, you know people talking about what they're what you know what type of TikTok are, are they seeing because it is 
constantly evolving to give you the sort of content that you're watching. So, you know, you, we, we kind of get what we ask for to a certain extent, uh, to quite quite a large extent on, on, on a lot of platforms. So I think there is an element we put, we perhaps give give ourselves a lot more credit um, that we think that everybody's very nice and stuff. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think some it, there, there is an element of we, we get what we pay for. Anyway, we should really move on. Yeah, we should. I should have put that one last. <laughs> All right. This next one here is, aside from gaining research experience, what can I do to prepare for PhD programs? This is by A Wagon on Human Factors subreddit, which we always love to see. They say, hi, everyone. I'm a mechanical engineering student. I really decided, I recently decided that I want to go to grad school for human factors. I have two years left in undergrad, but until I learned about human factors, I was convinced that I would go into the industry right after graduation. Thus, while I have a significant amount of industry experience, I feel super far behind on preparing for grad school. Love to hear your thoughts. What can I do to prepare myself for applying P to PhD programs and working in a research environment in general, planning to join a lab? But are there other things that I should do or consider? So Barry, what can they do to consider uh, preparing for grad school? I think if you're going to apply to PhD stuff, um, just from my own experience, please just do it as soon as you can. Um, don't do what I've done, which is try and think, oh, I'll do, I'll, you know, I didn't even think about doing a PhD after um, my in initial degree or anything like that. I was just straight into, straight into work, straight into industry. Um, now I've had a go at doing a PhD once and had to pause it because um, work life gets in the way, all that sort of stuff. So if you've got a chance of doing it early, crack on and do it because you won't get a better time, I don't think, than to do it and to dedicate time to it. Um, in terms of working in a lab environment, well, I don't know. The, the, I don't, if only I knew of a digital media lab that, that worked in human factors um, and was was a great way of meeting people, then um, then, maybe, then maybe I would go and join that. But I, 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 I can't think of anything else. <laughs> Is, is this always going to be perpetually an advertisement for the lab? Uh, yes. So look, there's a couple of <laughs> things that you can do that will really help you out here. One, understand the process for each institution that you are looking to apply to, because it can be different for every single place. Uh, and have a spreadsheet of that process. Make sure that you have marked down what state that you're at along the way at every point, right? That is one easy, really high return thing that you can do is understanding the process at each place, understanding what you need to do by when, when the deadlines are, assuming you're applying to multiple places. Uh, the other things that you can do, well, inform yourself on human factors, right? I mean, that is kind of the big thing. You've discovered the field and that's awesome. I'm super happy for you. We love the field too. That's why we're here. Learn more about it as much as you can. Come into that thing as prepared as you can be. Uh, and the third thing I would offer for advice is to really research the faculty that you are hoping to work with. Um, I think the faculty relationship that you will have with your mentor is a huge thing that often, I don't want to say it often goes overlooked, but um, I think it is a, is a critically important aspect to your success. If you have a good relationship with somebody or you guys agree on a lot of things and they can teach you in ways that you never thought that you could be taught, then you are going to have a more successful outlook. So I don't know, do your research. Is that, is that too, uh, on the nose for the last question? No, nope, spot on. I think. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about this last one. Uh, struggling with scope creep. This one is by Trick Prompt 5613 on the UX Research subreddit. Hi, all. I'm a UX researcher working with a very ambitious product exec. They're really excited to have me join their product team and conduct user research. However, what was supposed to be conducting usability testing with 10 participants has turned into me conducting user interviews or using t user testing, product requirement gatherings with as many users as we can get. They're thinking like 20 plus in the same time span we originally agreed upon. Additionally, I typically run usability testing one-to-one, -one, share the recordings, and present findings. However, this exec wants five other people to join each meeting. I'm worried about bias creeping in. I will do my best to expectations set, but find myself having trouble pushing back with someone who is above me at work. Any advice? Have you been in this situation before? Barry, this sounds familiar? Oh, does it ever? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, this is day whatever of being a human factors ux person this this is bread and butter um no, great that you've got loads of um, buy-in and and they really want to use research that's that's awesome um the bit about 
having wanting to double the number of, of participants, that's fine as long as they've also come up with the time machine with which to do it. Um, if you've already planned for doing 10 and we know how long, you know, you've, you've made your assumptions, you've done your planning, you know that you can do 10, 10 people in the time. There is literally not enough hours in the day to do 20 or to do them to the, to the quality that you've already specified. Um, so you, you need to go back and explain that. Um, you can do 20 if they give you twice as much time or they give you twice as much resource or whatever it is. Um, if you, in terms of the usability testing, if you usually you usually run them one to one, um, I've got no other, I've got no real problem with other people wanting to join the the usability testing as such, as long as you can set the ground rules. It's your usability testing. If they are coming to observe, that's fine. Um, if they want to be part of the engagement, that's fine. But it's pre-planned and it's rehearsed. If they just think they're going to go in there and, and as you've sort of alluded to, jump in and and come up with stuff, they're not in the room. Um, it is your um, engagement, and you you know that's what you're employed for. That that you have the um, hopefully the authority and the respect to be able to to do that. Um, if you get across that and they still want to do it in another way, well, you've done the best you can. Um, we've sort of said before, you know, pick your battles. Um, some, uh, may, you know, what is what is critical to, to you in getting the job done? If you have five people interrupting the user, um, uh, you, the, 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 the usability testing, is that a really a disaster as opposed, you know, as opposed to making sure that you only, only do the 10 participants? It's kind of up to you. Um, but unfortunately, I'd like to say that this only happens very rarely, but it, it is, it is the constant battle you have with, um, with trying to run any sort of research program. Nick, what do you think? Are you any different advice? Not really. The you know you you will uh, occasionally run into these situations where somebody else organizes the research and you're just kind of there, or people hijack your meeting for other motives. I think the best thing that you can do is expectation set and say, "Hey, look, I'm going to give you all an opportunity to ask questions, but you need to let me do my job here and do this thing up front, so that way we get what we need out of this thing." Uh, there's definitely sort of the, the benefit to ex education does not equal action, right? We know that. But explaining things in a way that's easily digestible to the, this exec might, you know, you might be like, hey, we agreed on 10 participants. Let me tell you, I need to spend X amount of hours preparing for each interview. I need to spend X amount of hours analyzing each thing. I need to spend X amount of hours actually engaging with and setting up time, you know, all this stuff. Explain the time commitments and really push back and say, look, I can do 10. I cannot do 20. Um, and if we start in including more people into it, it's going to degrade the quality of data because we have X, Y, Z. You know, I think if you sit down and explain it to them, hopefully they'll be receptive, especially if there's buy-in, which it seems like there is. I don't know, just something to consider. Mm -hmm. All right. It's time for one more thing. It's just the part of the show where we talk about one more thing. Barry, what's your one more thing this week? I'm going to do a two for it's been a while since I've done two no. for. Um, okay. Two more. Things. The first thing was um, I did my first executive meeting as president elect. The this today it was very exciting. That was all. That was cool. Uh, but no, the, the real thing I wanted to mention was I've I decided to. It's not often I get the time to pick up new books, a new book on 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 methodology. So I picked up one on black box thinking, which I thought was very cool. But then when I was looking at on Amazon, um, other purchasing platforms are available, um, and. The guy who wrote this one on black box thinking has also written like five other books on very, very similar, uh, very similar things, which has led me to buying all of the books as one package. I'm holding up now one, two, three, four, five different books by the same, same author. Looking at black box thinking, looking at um, where sport teaches us about achieving success, um, about rebel ideas, and about bounds, the the myth of talent and the power of practice. And so where I was going to buy one book, I've now got five books to read um, in the next sort of week. So, and I'm actually quite excited about doing so. I'm happy for you. I, I've been trying to get back into the book reading myself. Um, you can see I have two over my shoulders because it's only one month. Uh, and so <laughs> I'm trying to get into that too. But my one more thing this week is we're on TikTok. I mentioned it earlier. It's an interesting experience uh, from putting stuff up there. The first from their perspective, I see what they're doing. They're boosting the first couple of videos that you have to boost uh, others uh, to, to, you know, kind of promote yourself to other people as kind of the hook. You get so many views on it and you go, oh, this is great. Uh, and then it drops down. It's sneaky. It's predatory. 
Um, and I don't like the practice, but please go follow us. That's that's it. Uh, anyway, that's going to be it for today, everyone. If you like this episode and enjoy some of the discussion about robots in our lives, I'll encourage you to go listen to episode 217, where we talk about the Tesla bots and how they might be able to improve your life. Uh, comment wherever you're listening with what you think of the story this week. For more in-depth discussion, you can always join us on our Discord community. You can visit our official website, like I mentioned, sign up for our newsletter, stay up to date with all the latest Human Factors news. If you like what you hear, you want to support the show, there's a couple things you can do. One, wherever you're at right now, leave us a five-star review. That's free for you to do. It really helps us out. Two, you can always tell your friends about us. If you have like-minded Human Factors UXE friends, that love this type of stuff, let them know. And three, if you have the financial means, you can always support us on Patreon. As always, links to all of our socials and our website are in the description of this episode. I want to thank Mr. Barry Kirby for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk where to get a burger prepared by a robot? You can find me across all social media, but specifically at uh, Twitter on uh, Baz underscore K. On, come and hit up some of my interviews when I actually get some new ones published at 1202podcast.com. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on our Discord and across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it, it depends. depends.